This morning's passage is in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 1 through 9. Offerings for the temple. And David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great, for the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God, so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood. Besides great quantities of onyx and stones for setting, antimony, colored stone, colored stones, all sorts of precious stones and marble. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own gold and silver. And because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of offer, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the house and for all the work to be done by craftsmen, gold for the things of gold, and silver for the things of silver. Who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? Then the leaders of fathers' houses made their free will offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, and the officers over the king's work. They gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in the care of Jehel of the Jehel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly, for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. And that is God's word. Please be seated. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for coming today. I thank you for our scavenger hunt effort over there. Um, The back ride, I appreciate it. No winners yet, no no founder yet. I, I did that wedding feel bad for that bride. I think we'll hopefully scour this, this space after you all leave. But I, I once lost my wedding ring at church as well. Last summer, we were visiting a church, and I was pulling up my ring, and our, the, the stage was down there a little bit, and we were up a little bit, and I was just, you know, you do this when you're bored sometimes. I wasn't bored, I'm sorry. And I dropped my <laughs> ring. I dropped my ring, and it hit the ground, and it started rolling. And I heard it rolling several rows up, and I was completely distracted the entire sermon. I was like, this, this is, I don't know what's happening. I just lost my wedding ring, and it rolled several feet ahead, several rows ahead. You might be distracted today by the passage I'm covering. I'm speaking about finances. I'm speaking about money. I'm speaking about sacrificial generosity. And you're like, what? And now you're going to start squirming the rest of the sermon. That's, that's fine. Uh, thank you for coming. This is not your typical week. We usually work through... Um, chunks of the Bible, which I will attempt to do here in a moment, but we're in week two of our two-week strategic plan, capital campaign, the foundation campaign. And so there's, this is not a normal week for us. Next week, we'll jump back into our, our normal, regular scheduled programming of teaching through First Timothy. Um, but this is a strategic effort for us as a church, for a strategic reason and a strategic season for a specific purpose that we think God's calling us to collectively as a gathered people. And so... Before we jump into so much strategy, uh, can you all uh, bow your heads and let's pray and let's uh, seek the Lord as we try to honor God here with this time and this text and that God would use this time in our lives. Lord, I thank you for for this selected reading. I thank you for 1 Chronicles, Lord, and all that we're going to read about and discuss and think about today. I thank you for what you've done. From beginning of this world to the end of this world, I thank you for all that you've been intimate, you know, intimately involved in every aspect of our lives, God. I ask that you just really help us to understand you better, appreciate you better, and see you better as a result of our time together today. Uh, we love you and commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, to kind of get our minds wrapped around this concept of strategic generosity, of a special offering, 
Uh, we look through the tabernacle and what the Israelites went through as they constructed the tabernacle. This week, we're looking at the temple and what the Israelite nation went through when they built the temple, uh, Solomon's temple. And it was a grand, amazing temple. I spent my time last week and went through a third of the book of Exodus, 15 chapters. I'm not going to attempt to do that today. Uh, but we're, we're, we ended with our foundation campaign, just talking through it real quickly at the end of our sermon. I'm going to begin the sermon with it as opposed to making references to it just to get us all on the same page. And so we are jumping into a two-year capital campaign. We rolled this out to our, our leaders over our breakfast two months and 11 days ago. We pitched this idea to our leaders, and they seemed very excited about it. So we brought it to our backup. Our pastoral team has been praying about this for a couple of years. I've been praying about this personally for, I think, about three years in my personal prayer time. But we wanted to go public to our leaders. So two months ago, and some change, we rolled this out to all of our community group leaders, and then... One month and 18 days ago, we had a members meeting and we talked at great detail about this foundation campaign and what that would look like. And so here's some high level objectives we're looking to raise uh, money wise, $400,000 over the next two years. If you go to the next few photos here, bro, we got a, one would be an effort to reinvest in the next generation of our youth, our children's ministry with a two story playground that's 15 feet, six inches tall. That there's kind of a gap right now in what we can do with you know, goods and services at our size, like between you know, like 10 and 12, it's kind of like no man's land. I got a kid in that age that's nine, that's kind of like, I'm a little old for science school, I'm a little young for this room. It's like we're kind of trying to bridge the gap here. We'd still have them sit in the service with us, but it's a way to love, not 12 to 10 to 12 years, but to love kids that are not crawlers, that are not teenagers. There's an army of kids in this church, and we want to just love them in a practical, proactive way, if that makes sense. And so uh, a glassed-in, temperature-controlled, two-story playground is a chunk of what we're hoping to raise funds for. And the next is, if you go back to that first slide or one of the other slides that shows just our parking lot, that's our, our rock lot, uh, and that's our, our hopeful future lot. You're like, wow, that's an amazing parking lot. I know. You're going to look at parking lots the rest of your life thinking, wow, this is a Good lot. That's a bad lot. It's so, like there's some city code thing. There's some things we got to do. Uh, we we bought that land. We leveled that house and we expanded that rock lot. And we're on the clock. We're on a three-year clock with the city to make that permanent hard structure parking. And so I think we had like an accidental car accident, little fender bender, like nine months ago in our parking lot as people were leaving. It's just it's cramped. It's 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 a festive parking lot. The parking lot moves on you. It's fun. And so. Anyway, so we think a permanent structure would be nice. We could get some pickleball tournaments going, maybe. We get some basketball tournaments going, but we need a hard surface to do anything fun with. And so, and then I think the last thing is this space. And so we'd like to brighten up this space behind us to make it brighter. Because in Nebraska, half the year, it's kind of gloomy out. And if it's gloomy in this room, it's gloomy in your eyes, and it's hard for you to engage with worship and teaching and all that stuff. And so we don't want to black box this room out. We want to have natural light. We want to have new chairs. This is a potential prototype of what our chairs could look like in the future if we want to do this as a church to get Bibles off the ground of little things. This, the chairs you're in are a generation old. That's Bible speak for 40 years. They're, they're 40 years old. I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> we take care of them. We think there's a way to pick brighter colored fabric chairs to make the whole room feel brighter so you can engage with the Word of God and for teaching and singing. We just think it's, it's a strategic effort for a two-year season to really try to reinvest in what God's already done and is doing in our worship space, with our children's ministry, in our witness to the neighborhood. And if you go back to that very first photo of the outside architectural rendering, um, we'd like to do some landscape and some lighting just to kind of be a visible symbol to the neighborhood that we're here, we're alive and well, and you can be here with us and join us if you'd like to join one of our 15 community groups we have throughout the city and membership and all that fun stuff. So we're slow rolling this out to you. So this is stage two of the slow rollout. You're going to get email communication and all sorts of stuff will be coming down the pipeline in the next couple of weeks. But this is our last all gathering whole Sunday dedicated to this effort. We'll give campaign updates a couple times a month going forward. Uh, but our members and our leaders are prayerfully considering what God might have them do as followers of Christ and what that might look like in their life as we attempt to execute on this, this plan. And so, amen? So we, we just want to see what God's doing. And we got to prime the pump and see what God's doing in your life as we take that Pledge Sunday here in a couple of weeks. And so, but I'd like to walk through this text and try to kind of get our mind around what does that look like when 
when there's an effort that people raise funds for to reach the next generation and honor God's word, what does that look like? And so there's, there's pictures throughout the whole Bible about this. Our selective reading, which Cindy read for us, talks about an amazing example of what happened. And there's a lot of things here we're going to see here in our time. Um, the main point I like to drive home if I do my job during the rest of our time together is that the Christian life is a life of sacrifice. If you're a note taker, the Christian life is a life of sacrifice. And so our, my three main points I like to make in the structure of the, the passage that we look at is David is grateful for his God-given children. David is grateful for his God-given resources. And David is grateful for his God-given leaders. And so we, we finished talking about the tabernacle last week. And so you're like, what happened about that tabernacle, Mike? We talked about it all last week. They raised all that money. They built this amazing tabernacle. What happened to it? Well, in 1 Samuel 4, 11, the Philistines destroyed it in 1050 BC. Um, we're not going to get into a lot of these things. I'm going to give you a quick flyby, and then we're going to land the plane and talk about our actual passage. But I've got to give you some background. 1 Samuel 6, um, the Philistines had the tabernacle for a season, and God set himself free from them with no help from human man. And it's an amazing story in 1 Samuel 6. 1 Samuel 8, the Israelites are demanding a king to be like the other nations around them. And so God gives them a king the very next chapter. In 1 Samuel 9, he gives them King Saul. Um, in 1 Samuel 15, we see that King Saul is not what we thought he would be. Uh, 1 Samuel King, he's a, he's a man who the Lord rejects because he fears the people he's supposed to lead more than the God he's supposed to love. And then what happens in the very next chapter is David gets raised up, an anointed future king, um, and he's brought from watching sheep to being the king of one of the largest superpowers in the ancient world. And it's a, it's a saga, amazing story of years after year of David's path to the throne, which is some of my favorite parts of the Bible, which I loved reading which we're not going to cover today. First Chronicles 14, it talks about how there's growing peace. After David's raised up, there's peace. And a portion of the enemies of Israel, the Philistines, they're given victory over for a season. There's growing stability. There's growing prosperity. In First Chronicles 15, the ark, the ark of the covenant, the ark, which we talked about, which is the tabernacle houses, the ark is brought back to Jerusalem. It was in a different place in Israel at the time. First Chronicles 16, the ark is placed in a tent and worship kind of more normalizes. First Chronicles 17, the first six verses, David is thinking to himself, I live in a beautiful cedar home. I have growing peace and prosperity in my nation. And David talks about how he'd like to build for God a cedar home for, to house the, the ark, which is, which is noble, which is honorable. Uh, God comes back with him saying he has something bigger in mind, which we will find out is this amazing Solomon's temple with stone and gold, way vaster than just a cedar, a cedar temple. Um, but that, that God's temple would last for generations of Israelites, would come to hear about the word of God and experience God and have faith of God through the temple. First Chronicles 17, 11 through 13, David was told that he could not build the temple, but his son would, would build the temple. So what he desired to do, as worship and adoration and sacrificial generosity to God, he was not allowed to do because of his background, which, which is a whole sermon in itself. First Chronicles 18, David defeats more enemies and ushers in more peace and stability and prosperity to the whole nation of Israel. First Chronicles 22, David begins the hardest part of building anything with God's people. Capital campaign number one happens in 1 Chronicles 22. He buys the land, and there's crazy amounts of generosity, which we will look at here in a little bit. But, you know, raising money is harder than spending money. Can I get an amen, second service? Amen. There we go. Amen. You came today. Someone had their coffee this morning. All right, 1 Chronicles 22, 14. Uh, David uh, raises an incredible amounts of gold for future construction, and then our selected reading today, 1 Chronicles 29, 1 through 9. And so, obviously, David has some major mistakes in his life. We're not looking at those. But in general, David is God's man for God's people at this time in, their, in their, their lineage. And God blessed them tremendously through the leadership of David. And so, there's an amazing practical things we can look at about the Christian life as a life of sacrifice. And so, if you look at me at verse 1. And David, the king, said to all the assembly, which is a lot of the who's who of Israel... Very influential, powerful people are there who have been with David his entire career up to this moment in his career. And David said to the, all the assembly, Solomon, my son, 
whom alone God has chosen is young and inexperienced, and the work is great, for the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. And I imagine David is reflecting on his career journey. He is a an honorable son who wasn't counted worthy to stand by his brothers when the prophet Elijah came to get him and anoint him. He was out with his sheep, which is the most worst job you can get. The most lowly servant supposed to watch the sheep. David's out there, alienated from his family and his brothers, not counted worthy to stand next to his own brothers in the lineup meeting the local celebrity prophet. And he's out there with his sheep, and the prophet gets him. God chose him and brought him from a boy watching sheep to a king leading a nation, and a mighty man of war, a wise leader, a, a skilled orator, a skilled poet writer, a skilled songwriter, an, an amazing journey this man's been on. Um, a group of, it's just amazing how God took him from where he was to where he is now. He's in the prime of his career. He's in the prime of his leadership years. And he realizes that his son is on that same journey of inexperienced, young who also has the call of God on his life. He acknowledges that his son Solomon is young and inexperienced. And David knows that his predecessor, raising a ton of money as the first thing to do as a young leader, is going to be a challenge for him. So David leverages his military success, his leadership success, and his career to do that work for his son. David is grateful for the God-given children, and David takes care of the needs of the up-and-coming leadership, the generation of leadership behind him. He models this life of sacrifice. Let's continue reading. David is grateful for the God-given resources. David is grateful for the God-given resources. Read with me in verse 2. So I have provided for the house of my God so far as I am able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver. If you jump down to verse 3. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the, house, for the holy house, I have a treasure, my own gold and silver, because of my devotion to the Lord of my God. I will give to the house of my God. If you go to verse 4, the very last section of verse 4. He's going to overlay the walls of the house with gold. This is a grand effort David is attempting to jump into. There is a huge amount of his resources he's throwing into this. I mean, we've reflected on David. A group of us men have been praying together on Tuesday morning, early in the morning, to start you know, the week. We've been jumping into prayer, looking at Psalms to direct us. David has all kinds of skills and talents and abilities. He's He's got physical skills, mental skills, spiritual skills, musical skills. And God's blessed David richly. But God's also blessed David richly in resources of finances. When you conquer nations, conquer anti-Israelite tribes and nations around you that are raging war against your people, there's consequences of conquering a people. David has a whole immeasurable, huge storehouses of resources from his war plunder. Do you get what I'm saying? It is amazing how much he gave, how much money David gave. If you do the research on a talent, and a talent's like supposedly around 17 pounds, if you do the math on what's gold worth then, what's gold worth now, what number was all this talent? It's, it's, a, it's an ancient measurement we don't use here in America. It's between like six to seven billion dollars in gold, silver, and whatnot that David gave. That's a shocking amount of resources David gave. That's not a tithe, people. A tithe is 10%. In the Old Testament, people gave 10% generosity. They gave 10% of their income, their wealth, their crops. That seems to be like the op- more than it. That seems to be like he's giving 90% to God and he's living off of 10%. That is an insane amount of money now and an insane amount of money in the ancient world. Do we understand that, church? David led boldly in sacrificial generosity, which, which asks the question about how much money is too much money. How much money is too much money for you? How much money was too much money for David? How much money is too much money for you? And the answer to that very important question is, whatever amount of money replaces your trust in God. See, David's generosity completely grew as his wealth grew. There was a percentage of sacrifice that David stepped into as he worshiped and honored God and sacrificed for God and gave grandly to God in the efforts of God to reach and communicate to the next generation. 
I asked Marcus to pull up how much money I gave our very first Building Together Capital campaign and then the Restore campaign we did, I think, in the last 11 years. And I had a number in my mind I thought it was. I was like, is that romanticized? Is that real? Did we really give that much? Did we not give that much? I was thinking about like how much money I made back then. It's like way less than what I, was, than what I make now. Um, and I was, I was looking at it, I'm like, wow, that's shocking how much money I gave compared to my income. And that's shocking how little that number is now compared to how much we have pledged as a family now. Your, your generosity grows as you grow as a Christian. Your sacrifice grows as you grow. And it's not like a legalistic, dutiful thing. It's like, I love God. He's taken me from the field watching sheep as a shepherd boy to leading a, a nation. I love God every step of the way. And you see that love and the adoration of David's sacrificial generosity all throughout the book of Psalms. And I've had the honor of going through that with many of you guys the last couple of years. It's been, it's been amazing. The person that gives $100,000 versus the person that has a 35, the person who has a $100,000 income versus the person who has a $35,000 income, which is the average in our city, that's, they both have a sacrificial generosity threshold, which is different. It shouldn't be the same for both. And that's a reality. Even Jesus grabs this, this concept about sacrificial generosity and speaks about this when him and his disciples were in the temple. And in the temple walked in a widow and she threw in two mites, two pennies in the temple. And no one noticed her, no one noticed her gift. And then like either before or after her, some other wealthy person came in and there was an announcement that they were going to make their donation and they threw their amount of gold and coins in and it made this loud noise. And everyone's like, wow, look at the local businessman <laughs> making it rain. God bless the businessman, and no one notices the, the widow's gift. God noticed the widow's gift because if she was giving out of sacrifice, she was giving out of a percentage of her, her wealth that was more sacrificial than the wealthy. Does that make sense? There's, there's a, David is grateful for the God-given resources, and he leverages those resources in sacrificial generosity so that the next generation is set up for success, that they might know the one and true God. The Christian life is a life of sacrifice, and David models that sacrifice. And then verse 6, we go to our third point. David is grateful for the God-given leaders in verse 6. Then the leaders of the fathers' houses made their freewill offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders, and of thousands, and of hundreds, and the officers over the king's work. And it goes into their amounts that they gave. We're talking David gave six to seven billion. These Israelite leaders gave about 10 billion, scholars say. And the Israelite government, which David helped build up, gave billions. So we're talking billions upon billions of dollars in modern day money was handed to Solomon for the building of the temple. And that's where you get this principle about leaders giving first. Leaders, in our context, pledging first. And we're, we're trying to understand and obey the Bible. And we're not naive to act like we have all knowledge of all of the scriptures as a church, as a pastor, as a church. We're learning and growing and understanding about how to do what we do and why we do what we do and how to do what we should do. Our understanding of the scripture is growing. And so in our efforts on this capital campaign, the next week we'd ask our leaders to pledge first. Um, and I say leaders, I mean our pastors, our community group leaders, our discipleship group leaders, our ministry team leaders, our leaders to pledge first. We would like to come in here and celebrate with you, God willing, next Sunday, uh, what our leaders have pledged with actual numbers like the Israelites have recorded here in our passage today. But leaders give first. They lead the way. And I love how David, in his first capital campaign, 1 Chronicles 22, 14, he talks about, with great pain I have provided for the house of the Lord, weighing 100,000 talents of gold and million talents of silver and bronze. I mean, David went all in. He was very bold in what he was attempting to do, to give to the temple construction fund. And then here in, in verse 2, it said, I provided for the house of the Lord, so as far as I was able to, of gold and of the things of gold. In the second campaign, David gave again. He didn't give the bare minimum. He seemed to be a reverse tither, giving 90% of his income to the Lord or beyond. He models New Testament generosity. Jesus is obviously the perfect model of New Testament generosity, and Jesus gave it all. Jesus didn't tithe for us as God's people, as God's followers. He gave his life for us. He gave everything for us. Jesus gave it all. 10% is the floor of our Christianity, not the ceiling. And I just... Because of our strategic effort here, our foundation campaign, I think this is just a necessary thing. We have to have a little sidebar and say, 
Your pastors are tithers and beyond. Your community group leaders are tithers and beyond. Does that make sense? They're not leading from the behind in the finances of our church. They're leading from the front, which is very appropriate. Your discipleship group leaders and ministry team leaders are tippers to tithers and beyond. The reality is some people are making that step from 0% giving to 1% giving to 3% giving. They're just growing and being discipled in their finances. And like none of my kids, well, I have four children, none of my kids came down to the breakfast table in their life and said, you know what, Dad? I'm going to put money away for my retirement. I'm going to save for college. I'm going to get ready for my, pay down my credit cards. I mean, none of my kids said, I have a budget, Dad. Hey, Dad, I need it. I just feel led to the Lord to give. I mean, they've been discipled and trained. They're not doing that. <laughs> they've been discipled and trained as little children to make steps of faith in their finances. So if you're like, no one's ever told me or helped me in this area, we have a team of a CPA, a CFO, financial managers. We have a skilled stewards of God's word who work professionally, who have a passion for discipling Christians in the art of finances and what that looks like. Because the reality is, if you ain't ever trained how to handle your finances, you're probably not naturally into it, you know, in, you know, your guts aren't right. You need someone to train you on this. And if your parents didn't teach you or someone didn't teach you, there's godly people in this church that are really made a profession of this, who are leading by example, who are willing to walk through and teach you in this area. It's just a discipleship reality, men and women. But I, I want to be in a church that the leaders lead from the front. Our leaders pledge first, we lead by example, and we... we that, that seems like a straw man argument, but I want to be in a church where this is a reality. I don't want to be in it. Like, you want to, your leaders have skin in the game. And I, I mean, like, skin, not like there's some skin cells. Some, like, you know, specialist can come by with a little blue light and see the skin cells. I want to be in a church where leaders actually are obedient and walking by faith in this area. And so, obviously, if you're a college student or you're retired, your world's different. I'm not, I'm saying in general, though, does that make sense, men and women? I think that's a healthy thing for a church to be just that reality we want to be living in as a church, which we are, which I'm grateful for our leaders. Amen? And so we're talking about tithes is 10%, offerings is an above and beyond extravagant sacrificial generosity for a strategic effort, for a strategic purpose, and a strategic time. So we're in the process of collecting pledges from our leaders. We hope to report that and celebrate that with you next Sunday as we come together. Our pledge day for all of us, um, it, we have to make a decision about what we're going to do uh, for this projected idea and these costs we have for you. Uh, our pledge Sunday is May 5th. May 5th. Is when you can pledge May 6th, that's fine, but we need to make a budget and be practice good financial stewardship as an organization like we continue to do. That would be 70 days after the initial rollout to all you members and 90 some days since we rolled out to you leaders. And so we're looking, um, we're looking for, so let's look at the results of the leader's generosity in verse nine. Look with me at verse nine. And then the people rejoiced because they had given freely for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. It's amazing what God does when the people of God rally to reach the next generation and honor the Lord with their wealth and live a life of sacrificial generosity. That's billions of dollars. That's sacrificial generosity, men and women. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7, Paul writes this. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And it's not our plan or intention in this campaign to manipulate you emotionally to make you do things you could not and should not be doing. We want you to give cheerfully out of a stance of obedience and worship and sacrifice and love for the Lord and what the Lord's doing and join him in that work. If you cannot give cheerfully, do not give. If you cannot pledge cheerfully, don't pledge. You should just pledge a zero for us so we don't bug you to make sure, you know, it's hard to get a hold of some of you. You guys are elusive, you know. <laughs> but the result of the giving is grateful, godly rejoicing. The result of our giving, our hope is to have grateful, godly rejoicing. So 2 Chronicles 6, if you go on to the next book, the temple work is completed. 2 Chronicles 7, the glory of God fills that space, which you looked at a little bit last week. And a new generation of Israelites see and hear and learn about the word of God and the work of God in their life. Amen, church? So to get done quicker, to have...
time for our other two pastors to hop up and share what they're excited about. We want a variety of voices communicating a few about what we're working on and praying about and thinking. There's a gospel application I want us to hold on to with this passage and thinking about sacrificial generosity. There's power in sacrifice, men and women. Second Chronicles, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians 8 and 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. God was bold and extravagant in his generosity to us as his people. David lived a life of sacrifice because of his devotion to God. Jesus modeled the life of sacrifice because of his love for his us. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says this, Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that your suffering, because campaigns are suffering, there are strategic efforts, but there's still a sacrifice. And there's, there's a pain in a sacrifice. There's a cost in when we make sacrifices. Romans 3, 5, 3 says, Not only that, we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. There's a growing effort of stepping on faith. There's power in a sacrifice, and there's the Christian life is just seems to be defined by our sacrifice because of our love and our devotion for God. Because I have a little bit more time at the second service, Jesus did teach on the sacrificial life. Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Which means we're not seeking the kingdom of leisure, which is a strong kingdom in our culture. We're not seeking the kingdom of travel. We're not seeking the kingdom of pleasure. We're not seeking the kingdom of gold houses, of gold walls. It's a matter of priority. Am I seeking God's kingdom and the king of that kingdom first and foremost in my life? And so, as I end, our, our strategic plan of increased gospel productivity in these areas that we're praying for, increased Christian community in these areas we're praying for, and increased generosity in these areas we're praying for, please join us in that. We're your church members. We need you to pray. Our members are undefeated, men and women. We need you to be praying for this, Lord. I know that 71% of our church were not members at the time of our last capital campaign. God's done a great thing in our life as a church since we started this first effort years ago. But please be praying with us in our strategic plan. And for this, this foundation campaign, I ask that you would faithfully study with fresh eyes. Faithfully study. Don't let your past baggage with money which is very disorienting. Don't let that distract you from your present and the future. Faithfully study as we look at vision and faith and stewardship and commitment and sacrifice. Faithfully study those, those five different Bible studies that are going to be sent out to you here um, with fresh eyes. What does God calling you to do? What steps of faith is God calling you to make as a brother or sister in the Lord? And at the bottom of each of those five is a small little humor joke thing because we have humor at the bottom of the, we like laughing as a church along the way. So, so there's humor in there. So get to the carrot at the bottom of those Bible studies, men and women, but it'd, be, it'd bless your soul. So faithfully study. Second is faithfully pledge. Don't ghost us. If the answer is no or not now or not yet, that's fine. Just write that down and respond. That's appropriate. So we don't bug you. Is that okay? Because it's hard to get a hold of y'all. There's a lot of y'all, and it's hard. people don't use these things like they used to. They don't answer their phones, so it's hard to get a hold of people. Just respond when the digital pledge thing sent out to you. And then last, ask that you just, again, faithfully pray. Faithfully pray for us. We will have weekly updates going forward about challenges and hurdles and objectives we're hoping that God will answer prayer for along the way. Efforts like this can be super affordable or super expensive, and I think the church can pray and take down some of those road, roadblocks as we have real-time prayer requests being pushed out to you each week. We'll give monthly updates on Sunday mornings, probably two times a month, about what's happening holistically as a whole, as projects are being completed, as funds are being raised. We're doing this whole thing after we get the cash. We're going to raise the cash and spend the cash. We're not going to go into debt on this thing. That's just, we don't want to do that. Amen? All right, so we got... Josh and Ben are coming on up to share more about what is on their heart for the strategic plan and this capital campaign and how God has used it and will be using it in the future. So let's give them a round of applause, people. Thank you, Mike. 
you've already heard some fantastic points from Mike and even from our other pastors last week. So as not to belabor those, um, I want you to ask everyone in here to briefly consider a very simple analogy with me. And that is the analogy of the starter home. <clears throat> for some of you, a starter home may be 30 years in the past. And for some of you, a starter home may be a dream, something that happens 5, 10, even 15 years in the future. But I think there are some simple truths in this analogy that we all can relate to. When you purchase a starter home, you're most likely starting out a lot of different things in your life. You might be starting a career, you might be starting a marriage, starting a family, or simply planting your roots in a new city. These new adventures and unknowns fill you and the people who occupy the home with you with joy, dreams, and a vision for the future. And for the first year, you're just so excited to call that space your own. And one night, as you're sleeping, you feel a drop of water hit your forehead, sometime around year two, maybe year three. The shower, you realize, only stays hot for about five minutes. And the paint in the living room just doesn't match the paint in the dining room. And so, after about a year or two, you begin to improve your starter home. <clears throat> you know that the the home needs things that are going to be fixed. You know that it's important to fix these things. And so you find the most important things to fix. You find that you patch the roof and you buy a new water heater. And over time, you, you get rid of that ugly lime green dining room and you paint it with something a little bit more fresh. And hopefully, Lord willing, you convert one of the guest bedrooms in the starter home into a nursery. You know that the occupants of the home are starting to change. The family is multiplying and the home must change to meet those needs. Five years or so down the road and you have two, three, or four little ones, baby gates keep popping up in every hallway, keeping the kids from getting into dad's office, and the backyard that was un once only used for the dog is now littered with toys, bikes, and well-loved, if not a little bit gross, Barbie dolls. The family has again changed. It's grown. It has different, new, and exciting challenges. And it's time for you to buy the bigger dining room table, to put up the bunk beds and the swing set, and to clear out the garage of that old hobby so that you can park your minivan. Now consider Sower Church. Ten years ago when we embarked on our first capital campaign together, the average Sunday attendance for adults was about 50 to 75. The number of children in the church was about 40, and I think between Ben, Shane, and Mike, they had about 50% of that. <laughs> Five years ago, when we did the Restore campaign, the church had approximately 120 adults and maybe 60 kids, and we improved. We literally patched the roof and did a lot of other things to make sure that we could continue to serve the people of Lincoln. Now, because of the Lord, we are approximately 250 adults on a Sunday and approximately 100 children. The family has changed. But I don't want to gloss over this analogy of the church body as a family because this is biblical in nature. Consider 1 John 3.1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and this is what we are. So as God's love unites us as brothers and sisters in Christ, then may we consider this building our home and living, this out, living out this joyful news to the world. Also consider Galatians 6.10. So then, as we have every opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Ten years ago, God blessed this church with a starter home. And five years ago, we patched that leaky roof and made sure that we had everything we needed to serve the people. But as the family grow and ch grows and changes, we have another opportunity to do good. To do good works that glorify God in this city to see the family of God continue to faithfully grow both in numbers and in community with one another as it has so far by the hand of God and by his blessing. I'm very excited to join each of you in this opportunity and continue to glorify God with the people, the building, and the grounds of Sower Church. Thanks. Amen. Amen. I, I too am very excited for the opportunity just personally for our family to be involved in this, but also for us as a church. Uh, as Mike shared, living generously and, and giving generously, it is a sacrifice and it is a step of faith. And I think about Genesis chapter 22 when Abraham was asked by God to, to take a big sacrifice. And uh, 
And this is where Abraham named God, one of the names of God, which is Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Yira, the Lord who provides. And Abraham took that step of faith, and it says that he even believed God would do something like raise Isaac from the dead, that kind of thing. That was the kind of faith that he exercised as he did the sacrifice. And, uh, and we have an opportunity to, to step out in faith and to give. And I've been involved with many of these. And what I have found personally, what we have found as a family, is that every time we, we step out in faith and, and we give generously, we see God come through in just amazing ways and demonstrate that he is the Lord who provides. For a few of you, it doesn't matter the amount. For a few of you, $100 would be a big stretch, a stretch of faith. For a few of you, $10,000 wouldn't be anything. It wouldn't be a big deal. The amount doesn't matter. What matters is, am I exercising faith? Am I trusting God and, and sacrificing to be generous? And so for us as a family, it's, you know, we, ha we think about the next year or two, and it's like, wow, we've got some really significant expenses coming. But we're stepping out in faith. We're giving generously, and it's kind of like, I, I don't know where this, some of this is going to come from. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing God demonstrate once again that he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. He will provide. And I am eager for you all, for this church, to have the opportunity to step out in faith. And I'm looking forward to hearing story after story from you all. Like, man, this was, we trusted God, and here's what God has done. Here's how he's come through. Here's how he's provided. And, uh, and to be able to celebrate that together. Uh, and so that's really an opportunity for all of us and that I'm excited about and excited about for us as well. So let's pray and then we'll move into communion. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word and that you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Uh, we are eager to participate with this and we just thank you that this is a, an act of faith that we have the opportunity to do and that pleases you. And so we just ask you to help us and and uh, and fill us with you and with faith as we step out in faith in Jesus name amen